We said that the ultimate fulfillment of Mashiach coming and the Messianic era was when the physical world would reflect the spiritual, when body wouldn't be an obstruction to spirituality, but would, be, would help express spirituality. This will be ultimately realized during the era of Tichia Samesim, the resurrection of the dead. The average enlightened individual sees the idea of a bodily resurrection of the dead as some fantastic belief reserved for either horror films or religious fanatics, but many are surprised to discover that the resurrection of the dead is one of the main pillars of which the Jewish faith stands. Resurrection of the dead at some point in the messianic future is very much a Jewish belief to the point where the sages have said that one who denies the reality of the resurrection is as if he has denied the entire Torah. In fact, the Talmud says that one who rejects the idea, one who rejects belief, will not merit to be a part of it, measure for measure. The Talmud relates that the resurrection is alluded to many times throughout the five books of Moses. And the books of the, prophet are, the, books of the prophets are full of uh, open examples, uh, outright predictions of the future resurrection. If you take a look at uh, text number one uh, on your handout the, from the book of Isaiah, he says in no uncertain terms, your dead will live, their corpses will rise, you who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. In addition, Ezekiel assures the people that you should know that I am the Lord when, uh, when I open your graves and lead you out of your graves as my people. An angel tells the, the prophet Daniel, many of those who lie in the dust of the ground will awake. Jewish tradition maintains that all the Jewish people and all of the righteous from among the nations of the world will experience the resurrection. It's something that is repeated daily in our prayers or hinted at daily in our prayers. In fact, the Moda'ani prayer, which a, which a Jew says every morning upon, upon waking up, uh, is a prayer like a, experiencing a glimmer of the resurrection in the future. If you take a look at uh, source number two on your handout, it, you'll see that uh, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, codifies the resurrection of the dead as the 13th, the final principle of faith. The physical manifestation of the redemption, which is called the world to come, includes a physical resurrection of the souls along with their bodies. If you'll take a look, you could see that uh, in text number three of your handout. In truth, you know, the resurrection of the dead is, is really not that difficult a concept to accept. We already believe that God created the world something from nothing, that he, brought, he took nothingness and made it into somethingness. So it shouldn't be very difficult to comprehend that God can create a second time something from an already existing, but merely it has disintegrated or dissolved. If we examine things closely, you'll find that there is a glimmer of resurrection in the workings of the natural world. The French philosopher Francois Voltaire once said that it's no more surprising to be born twice than to be born once. Everything in nature is resurrection. So let's take a look at some areas in nature where we get sort of a glimmer to the idea of the future resurrection. The Tiferes Yisrael points to the idea of a caterpillar. He says, caterpillar spins itself a cocoon, it remains inside until, ostens uh, until ostensibly it dies, uh, and parts of it decay, and it becomes a thick liquid. Eventually, this liquid blob becomes a beautiful butterfly with wings that bursts from the cocoon and flies through the air. So the entire appearance and lifestyle, the eating habits, everything about the butterfly is completely different than the caterpillar. So it decays, it dissolves, and it's transformed into this beautiful new creature. We see also the idea of resurrection in, in vegetation, in the cycle of vegetation, growing trees. Uh, think about a, a, a planted seed. So you plant a seed in the ground, and first it, it rots under there, and only afterwards it sprouts into, only after it rots, it sprouts into a, um, a healthy tree with beautiful fruits and flowers many times greater than the original planted seed. In fact, there's a, a custom in Jewish tradition that when a person leaves a cemetery to uproot some of the grass, 
And that's the idea behind that is that indicates that the grass, the grass seeds uh, sprout forth only after the seeds are buried in the earth. Reminds us that when we go to uh, a cemetery, that this is not the end all and be all, that resurrection is coming. This was actually an analogy used by the Talmudic sages to express the idea of resurrection to the pagans. If you take a look at text number four, the Egyptian queen Cleopatra had trouble fathoming the concept of an enhanced life back in a body after it was decayed. So Rabbi Meir responded with the example of a wheat seed which decomposes before sprouting new life. You know, I remember, uh, just on a personal note, experiencing sort of uh, an idea of resurrection. Um, I grew up in Florida, and in Florida, you know, the weather is, is wonderful every day. If it rains, it's you know, only in the afternoon from 3 to 3.15. And, and, but uh, I had never been to the Northeast or really anywhere that it had snowed. So when I went to, when I went to a rabbinical school, it was the first time that I really experienced snow. So I remember I came to, I came to Yeshiva, it was in the Northeast, and it was the winter time, it was January. And my first weekend, we had a snowstorm like you wouldn't believe. And when I looked out the window, I saw what appeared to be death. The trees were barren, the sky was gray, and all day the sky was gray, and it got dark at 4 p.m. And again, I looked out into the forest and there was trees with no leaves. It, was, it seemed like a lifeless wasteland. Little did I know, you know, from my Florida boy mentality, that just around the corner, this forest was going to be teeming with life and, and full of lush, lush uh, foliage. So we see the idea of resurrection appearing, showing itself throughout nature. In the modern era, it really shouldn't be challenging to grasp because it's known that nothing can be created or destroyed. It merely exists in a different form. It was concluded in the late 1700s that matter only changes shape. It never, it, it always retains its mass. In other words, you can pulverize things as much as you want. No matter how much something is pulverized, it can never be eliminated. Judaism made note of this concept actually long before uh, modern academia did. King Solomon said that I know that whatever God does, you, you could see it in text number five, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it or anything taken away. Also, we see from Rav Sadiagon that even, even if an object is burned with fire, it can never be annihilated because it's impossible to destroy something to the point that it becomes nothing. That is something reserved for the Creator alone. So resurrection of the dead refers to the rebuilding of the body uh, from matter and energy that's conserved in the universe. You know, with the modern discoveries in DNA, it makes the idea of a resurrection intellectually acceptable and feasible, even to the most ardent rationalist. The fact that every cell contains all of the information that can, re that can reconstruct an entire body and the scientific success in, in cloning creatures from a single cell shows that the idea of a bodily resurrection is not as far-fetched as once thought. Interestingly enough, in 2008, there was an article in National Geographic where researchers sought to bring back a variety of the woolly mammoth. We have a lot of woolly mammoths preserved in Siberia in the, in the permafrost of the ice. So it wasn't, uh, the, the article, the discussion in the article wasn't whether it was possible to do this, to bring back these creatures and create sort of a, you know, a Jurassic Park style uh, exhibit. The, the article focused on whether it was ethical to do it, but the ability was, was a sure thing. In fact, Tom Gilbert, who's an expert in ancient DNA at Copenhagen University, optimistically said in the article that if you can do it with a mammoth, you can do it with anything that's dead including your grandmother. An interesting idea that's brought out by the Chafetz Chaim is he writes that whenever you see, whenever the, the trend in society is forgetting uh, a, a main concept in Judaism or spirituality, that God somehow instills in people's minds perhaps a, an idea in technology, an invention, that reinstates the idea. And the Chafetz Chaim notes, he says that when people in society 
we're beginning to forget or, or, or beginning to not believe that the heavens could see what was going on on the earth. He said that the, the telescope was invented. In other words, that if the people down here could see what's going on in the heavens, it should make sense to them that what's going on in the heavens can see what's going on down here. And the, the truth of the matter is that throughout history, uh, different inventions have sort of uh, been used as, as good examples of refreshing our core spiritual beliefs. When GPS systems came out, many Torah scholars said that it reminds us that just as the GPS can precisely detail exactly where a person is and what they're doing, how much more so can God, the divine, know exactly where we are at any given time? Now, the question is, what is the purpose of a bodily resurrection? Why, why is that the ultimate goal, that the soul comes back into a body and that it continues it is rewarded in that way, that that's the pinnacle, that's the, the greatest accomplishment. So the idea is, that the, in Judaism, that the body and soul are a team. They're a team to accomplish a goal of uplifting the, the physical world uh, through Torah and mitzvahs. The objective is not, like it is in some faiths, to escape reality, to escape the world by donning, donning robes and endlessly meditating. The idea is instead to bring heaven down to earth by sanctifying the physical world which one is a part of. In other words, the act of charity, right? The commandment of charity, the goodness that comes about through charity would not be able to be accomplished without a physical hand that could give the physical coin. Nor could a kind word be spoken without a physical mouth. So the body and soul are a team that implements spirituality in even the most coarse physical world. One idea, you could see in an example of in text six in your handout, is, is, is an analogy. Think about it like this. Why would the body and soul be rewarded together? Imagine you have a house that is burning, it's burning down, burning on fire. And there are two witnesses to what's going on, this house that is slowly burning. The, the witnesses, though, are one person who is, is blind and the other person who is in a wheelchair. He can't walk. So the blind person would like to help. He, he feels the heat of the, of the house that's on fire. and He wants to help. He wants to save the people that are in the house. But he can't do it because his senses are limited. He can't see where the people are located. And the gentleman in the wheelchair is also limited. He sees what's going on and he wants to help the people, but he can't do it because his wheelchair limits him. So what do they decide to do? The blind person puts the, the individual in the wheelchair onto his shoulders. They run into the house and through the guidance and through their teamwork, they're able to save everyone in the house. So they, they imagine that before the house burns down, they manage to take everybody out. They save the entire house. They're heroes. So the mayor of the city convenes this big meeting and award ceremony. He wants to give the key to the city to, uh, to one hero who, who saved the house. And they start arguing between them who should get this medal that the, that the mayor wants to give them. And the blind person says to the one in the wheelchair, well, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be able to get into the house. I was the one who facilitated your legs. I was the one who facilitated moving around all over the house. But the one in the wheelchair says to the blind man, if it wasn't for me, you would, you would never have been able to see where anybody was. So the mayor decides, I'm going to reward both of you. That both of you without each other would not have been able to accomplish what you accomplished. And therefore, I plan on giving both of you the reward. So this is really the idea of the body and soul being rewarded. In the future, God will judge the body and the soul together, either rewarding or correcting them both as one unit, their team. In the messianic future, where, when the dead will once again live and the entire world will have reached its pinnacle, and the true purpose of God's creation to bestow goodness upon his handiwork will be experienced forever. Thank you once again for joining us into our course on Mashiach in the Messianic era. May we soon merit that we should see it in an actual way.